Today on Invest Talk, we talked about the Halloween investing strategy, answered questions on stock splits, AIFF, and NVR, and then ended the day with a discussion on if the Fed is stepping beyond its traditional bounds. This is Invest Talk, independent thinking, shared success. My main focus point today concerns this question What is the Halloween strategy? And no, I'm not talking about what you should wear to go trick-or-treating with your kids or go to a party with your significant other. The Halloween strategy is about investing, and it offers a unique take on market timing, suggesting that stocks better perform between October 31st, Halloween, and May 1st. And so this approach encourages investors to buy stocks in November and hold them through the winter months and sell them in April, focusing on other assets during the summer. Now, the strategy challenges the idea of buy and hold, investing by instead proposing that you step away from stocks for half the year. Interestingly, the roots of the Halloween strategy date back centuries. The idea likely began in the United Kingdom, where wealthy investors would retreat to their country estates in the summer and leave markets pretty quiet and with low volume until the fall. Today, some argue that professional traders and and analysts taking vacations in the summer might still have an impact and lead to reduced market activity and performance during these months. But the seasonal effect, also called the Halloween indicator, remains something of a financial mystery. The data shows the strategy can work, but the reason why it can work is certainly less clear. Some believe the summer months come with higher uncertainty, encouraging investors to stay cautious. Others argue it's just behavioral. Investors and markets are more active in the colder months, leading to more positive performance. But what else could be going on? Well, major market events like Black Monday in 87 could be skewing the results, right? This is essentially looking back historically at data over time periods, slice of the year, and saying, how does this perform versus a different slice of the year? And so if by random chance or by political event or by anything... More negative events happened in one time period by random chance. The data would still tell you, well, these months perform better. These months perform worse. Another issue is that if the effect did exist, even in a relatively efficient market, it should be quickly arbitraged away, right? If you know that stocks are going to sell off in April, well, then people would start front running it, selling it off in March, and then in February, in January, and the effect would drift. And so it is unlikely that in an efficient market that this is a replicable strategy over the long term. So does it work? Well, historical data, like I said, does seem to lean in its favor, but it's far from guaranteed. The reason why I want to bring this up is because any disciplined investing approach needs to be grounded in some sort of economic sensibility. I'll give you an example. It could be the case that for a 10-year period, companies with the letter A outperformed. But is that because it started with the letter A? Or is it because companies that started with the letter A were more likely to be tech companies? Or is it because Apple in that period outperformed everything and dragged the median perform- or the mean performance up? There are all sorts of factors that, yeah, you can sort on companies that start with the letter A. But is that really the reason why companies may perform better the next 10 years? And so the bottom line is you need to understand the limits of data. You need to understand the dangers of drawing nonsensical conclusions from those data, from that data, because investing is about sensibility. It's about making thoughtful and reasoned decisions, because only through making thoughtful and reasoned decisions can you hope to create a strategy and a portfolio that can help you achieve your financial goals goals. For comprehensive investment resources, visit us at investtalk.com. Now switching gears, let's talk about the market today. U.S. stocks finished lower, ending near worse levels. Underperformers included pharma, semis, industrial metals, auto suppliers not doing particularly well today. Outperformers included managed care, banks, insurers, credit cards, and airlines. The Dow down 22 basis points, S&P down 33, NASDAQ down 56, and the Russell 2 down 23 basis points. Dollar index was down 30 basis points. Gold finished up 70 basis points. Crude oil settled up 2.1% on the back of some uh, pretty disastrous weeks before that. 
Earnings were a major focus today. More than half of the S&P 500 constituents have actually now reported, with Google being a pretty big bright spot on the cloud and AI commentary. But earnings really only one of the moving pieces that investors have been tracking today. The soft no-landing narrative received some further support from today's ADP and private payroll numbers, as well as the Q3 GDP reports. Elections still obviously a near-term overhang that could continue to dampen volatility. And why would it do that? Well, the market seems to be in a wait and see mode. So that pro- that could continue to keep volatility low, uh, well, for the next week. Favorable seasonality and a resumption of buybacks looming as well on the horizon as we move out of the earnings period. Speaking of that economic data I mentioned a little bit ago, big beat for October ADP private payrolls, printing at 233,000 versus the consensus 108,000. Official non-farm payrolls report coming on Friday. Q3 GDP grew at a 2.8% rate against the forecast for 2.6. So GDP still strong for the third quarter. Release noted an increase in consumer spending, exports, and federal government spending, and that certainly would uh, help it beat the consensus estimate. September pending home sales came in much stronger than expected as well, rising 7.4% month over month. PCE, personal income, spending, ECI, claims, and Chicago PMI are all out on Thursday, while the employment report, ISM manufacturing, and construction spending will be hitting on Friday, and that will round out the week. And come Friday, we will be in the second to last month of the year. Hello, wanted to get your opinion on Sprout Farmers Market. The ticker symbol is SFM. Thank you. So Sprout's Farmers Market, ticker SFM, uh, is exactly what it sounds like. It is a health food grocery store. Uh, They specialize in natural, organic uh, groceries, supplements, meat, seafood, all you can think about that you'd see at your local Vons, Ralph's, Albertsons, Kroger's, Sprouts is going to bring to you, but with a tilt towards being healthier and organically grown products. Now, it's had quite the run over the past year, up 174%. Why is that? Well, Sprouts has consistently beat earnings quarter after quarter, I think on average 12% over the past year. And so with that run up, They've been pretty elevated in terms of their relative valuation. But before we dig into that, let's take a look at the company fundamentally. They've got about $1.6 billion in debt on an $11 billion market cap company. They do not pay a dividend. They have never paid a dividend. Their margins have been increasing from 31% gross margin to 35% in the most recent fiscal year. Their net margin, as you would expect with most grocery stores, is under 4 or 5%. Uh, it grew from three to three point eight percent, so that's still that's still pretty solid. Projected to be about four point six percent this year. Now they bought back some shares over the past three years, which is something that we like. And their earnings, like I said, it has consistently beat over the past year or so, like over more than a year. And so they keep getting earnings upgraded as well. And so this company's cash flow is improving, their profitability, their margins are expanding. Something that we like. If you look at their chart over the past year, it is nearly straight up and to the right. Not a lot of drawdowns, if I'm being honest, right? They went from 50 all the way to about 120, 118 right now. And so with all of that in mind, here's why I don't think now is the right time. They're trading at 32.4 times forward-looking earnings, earnings, trading almost 10 times their book value. And so this is at the upper end of this five-year range. It is, in my opinion, not a point at which you should be buying this company. But that being said, it is fundamentally a strong company. It is a well-run business, and it probably will continue to be a stable and quality business for years. And so I would certainly keep this on my watch list, but I do not think at 32 times forward-looking earnings that this grocery store is a buy right now. Thanks for calling. Speaking of calls, we have a live call. Jordan from San Clemente, who has a question about BG. Do you own it or are you looking to buy it? Yeah, I'm looking to buy it. I uh, had a price trigger and it fell at that point, so I'm wondering if it's still a good buy. Sure, let's take a look at BG. And so BG, it's a global agro business, Bungie, uh, Bungie Global. That is what BG stands for. And essentially what they try and do is they try and connect farmers to directly to consumers by buying, selling, storing, and transporting agricultural commodities. 
Unfortunately, it's taking forever for this to load because sometimes my internet is slow. So let me pull up something on my other screen while FactSet loads really quickly. <clears throat> it didn't like to load. So I don't have everything I usually have when I'm looking at this, but I do have some of these figures. So let's take a look at their growth over the past five years. Uh, their growth has been about 5.4% on an annualized basis. Though over the past three years, uh, their revenues dropped off pretty precipitously from 67 billion back in 2022, projected to be only 53 billion this year. Their net income has fallen as well. They reached a high last year at 22.243 billion. That's projected to come down to about 1.3 billion this year. Take a look at their margins. Their margins are expanding on their gross margin. Their EBIT margin is expanding as well from 1.4% to 3.5, 3.7% over the past five years. Now, in terms of strength, they kind of dropped off a little bit back in 2021. It hasn't since recovered. You can see this divergence here uh, between it and the S&P 500 starting back in 2021. And so in 2023, last year, they underperformed about 23% that were outperforming their industry overall. And so from what I can see is it looks like revenue has slowed. Revenue has slowed. Margins still look pretty fine to me. Return on equity has has improved pretty substantially over the past five years. You know, taking a look at this, I'm going to be honest, Jordan, unfortunately, I cannot see everything that I usually can see uh, when I'm trying to answer a caller question. So the best I can do is when I do get this going, uh, we can run it back to this question again. Uh, but I don't want to give you an answer without complete information. So hopefully we can answer it later on in the show. Uh, and then until we can, uh, thanks for the call. It's a $12 billion company. It looks like in terms of debt, uh, they're not too levered. They have about $5 billion in debt and their interest coverage ratio is about 3.91. Their cash flow has been improving even as revenue has fallen off. Uh, they have a little bit of short interest, but nothing too crazy. And they pay a solid dividend that looks like it was pretty consistent uh, over the years. Around 3.5% is where it was five years ago. 3.2% is where it is now. So keeping all this in mind, let's look at its relative valuation. It's trading at a forward-looking earnings about 9.3 below its average. Its price to book is about 1.2. Uh, that's below its average uh, as well. It's down a lot. It's down 25% over the past three months. And so from a technical perspective, it honestly looks like it's broken its lower support levels and it could be headed lower. I know it's triggered your uh, your price target in terms of your entry price, uh, but I would not buy it just because it's triggered it. Uh, it looks like to me uh, that it's still trading about where it has been in terms of its valuation over the past five years. And there's a likelihood that it could be trying to find some new support now. So uh, it may have triggered it, but it still could head lower. And overall, I honestly don't like the fact that revenue has fallen off as much as it has. Uh, even as cash flow uh, has improved. So I would still keep it on my watch list uh, for now, uh, but just because it triggers your price doesn't necessarily mean you have to do it. And for now, I would hold off. So thank you for holding on all of this time. This may set the Invest Talk record for the longest amount of time it took to answer one live call question. Now, from time to time, our listeners turn into viewers and our viewers leave questions on the Invest Talk YouTube channel channel. And if you want to become one of those special people, just go over to YouTube and search invest talk with two T's and leave your question in the comment section. This question came in earlier and it's asking about two stocks, but I think I'm going to only answer the first one that is mentioned one that starts with an A that maybe because it starts with an A will do well. But anyway, it says, what are your thoughts on AIFF for a short hold towards earnings? And so AIFF is Firefly Neurosciences. And Firefly Neurosciences, it's a med tech company, uses AI to analyze brain waves, improve brain health outcomes for patients and neurological and mental disorders. Now, it does not make much money at all whatsoever. And by that, I mean, it does not make any money. It has not since 2020. I know there was an acquisition that actually changed the name from, I think, Wave Rider or something like that to Firefly. Uh, it is breaking all sorts of levels of support. It has been headed downward in a downward spiral for so, quite some time. But over in September, it started to consolidate between the three and four dollar range. There is serial issue of shares. Certainly, it is very, very small. I think it's twenty nine million dollars. You know, here's the thing. Uh, this is 
more than anything, a gamble, and you're asking about a short hold towards earnings. And what we pride ourselves on is being an investing show where we want to help investors think more clearly about investing, holding things for the long term. And so I don't think this is a long term hold. Uh, may it do well towards earnings? Certainly could. Incredibly small company, lots of risk, not anywhere near making any money. So in terms of investing, I would definitely pass on Firefly Neurosciences, AIFF. Thanks for being here. If you found this video valuable, please like it and subscribe to our channel for more insights. I have a question about stock splits and general idea. Is it a good idea to purchase companies that are going into the stock splits that are already on my watch list? Because as I understand, the general trend is that stocks also often spike after the split shortly thereafter. So if I'm already interested in the stock and I've kind of been following it, looking for a good entry point, and I just want to kind of find out for some of the stocks if it's a good choice, I guess, to buy them with the intent maybe of unloading them after a bump in the stock split, um, maybe keeping half and then unloading the other half. All right. Thank you for your help. So a stock split, let's, let's tackle this from the most basic part of the question first. A stock split is essentially when the number of shares increases, shares outstanding, increases for a company by some factor. So, you know, maybe you had 100 shares and shares were worth $10 a share and you go to a, you know, one for two split or two for one split. And now they're 200 shares and they're worth $5 a share. Now, if you do the math on that and you look at the market value of the company, nothing has changed. Stock splits are things that happen on paper where the only thing that happens is really the price of the stock changes either up or down, depending on if it's a split or a reverse split. So because nothing is changing, there's fundamentally nothing different about the company. Just because you are thinking about buying a company and the stock is splitting, The split itself shouldn't really be a reason for why you buy it. Now, it is true that sometimes stock splits can benefit the stock in the short term. Why? Well, if a company is trading at $1,000 a share and they do a 10 for one and it's now trading at $100 a share, psychologically, some people go, oh, the stock's cheaper. You know, maybe some people didn't have the capital to buy shares and now they do. And so it is true that the, the volume, the liquidity in that name can increase. But the reality is, is that they've been studying it and it's mixed results, right? Like it does at a certain point, it can increase liquidity, but those are noisy numbers. It could be that fundamentally there is something about the company uh, from a macro environment, micro environment that influences why it has had positive performance. And then so to say that a stock is splitting and therefore performance will be positive, well, it's not even clear that it's more likely than not that it'll be positive. So if a company is something that you are watching, just because there is a stock split should not be a reason why it finally puts you over the edge. Because again, stock splits are just things that happen on paper, nothing changes. Looks like we have another live call. Let's go to William and Phoenix. You have a question about closed end funds. FGI and MEGI. They're both infrastructure closed end funds. I just had a question. If you think they're good investments, I know there's a lot of debate about whether or not they are. I'm looking to boost my income in retirement in a Roth IRA. Could you repeat the uh, tickers for me? I, I didn't hear the tickers at the start of your question. Sure. Sorry. A-S-G-I. Okay. Is the first one. And the second one is M-E-G-I. Okie doke. So let's take a look at M-E-G-I. Is that the, the M-S-V-I-F growth portfolio? It's a global infrastructure. Uh, I see it right here. Okay. Sometimes it's tough to come up. If you've been listening the whole show, you know that my computer has not agreed with me. So let's take a look at the second one uh, first, and it's going to be MEGI. It is a total return fund. And essentially what it tries to do is invest 80% of its assets in securities issued by infrastructure companies. Let's see if it's accomplishing that Uh, right now. It looks like It is. And so it holds 62 names. The top 10% holds 53%. So it's not overly diversified. Uh, It's not a a particularly big fund. It's a pretty small fund, $806 million. 
Uh, it is looks like they're using some sort of leverage because they own over 100% in equities, right? They are at 117% of the fund is in equity. So they're doing some sort of leverage right there. It's invested in multiple countries. Uh, it's invested in the US, about half of that, UK, Italy, Canada, Spain. Um, overall, interesting. Yeah, it's closed end funds, so you're not going to see any flow data. Um, from a return perspective, it hasn't been doing particularly well over the past quarter, but year to date, it's up about 19%. And so what they're doing essentially is they're trying to get some sort of income by investing in common stocks, by investing in preferred stocks, convertible securities. And overall, it looks to me like, where's the flow here? The problem with closed end funds in terms of me looking at them is sometimes I don't get the proper amount of data here. Um, let me do one thing here. Let's pull something up on another screen. It's been a rough, rough day over here. Okay, sorry. It's not your fault, you know. It's sometimes, sometimes things just shake it out, and we just, we just move on, and we just, we just do the best we can to yeah. answer all of your questions. So let me see if I can get this from another data source. How's your day going today? It's pretty good. Yeah. Thanks. Okay. Let's take a look at this and see if it pops up on. <laughs> There's no information. Here. Um, honestly, it's it's kind of difficult with some of these closed end funds. There's not a lot of not a lot of accessible data. The liquidity is going to be lower, obviously. Uh, generally, if I'm looking for increasing income, uh, I, I think that one of the things you got to be worried about with holding funds, right, is uh, the fund structure, right? So let's talk about this in the abstract. And I think one of the beneficial things, most beneficial things you can do, no matter what you're trying to attack in terms of the asset class or what the purpose of holding something is, is actually investing in ETFs. Why? Uh, well, they're incredibly efficient in terms of pricing, but they're also incredibly efficient in terms of taxes as well. So I would tend to stray away from some of the older fund structures and look more towards ETFs. No matter what you're looking for, uh, I think overall they can be better because oftentimes when people think about trying to get income, they forget about the disadvantages or the advantages of the underlying thing they're holding when they're trying to get that income. So uh, overall, I would tend to tilt towards trying to do it in a fund structure that is like an ETF uh, that gives you those benefits from a tax perspective uh, versus this fund. And you know what? One of the things I don't like about this fund is it's really hard to find some good information on it. So I think because of that, I have to say, I'm going to pass on this one. So have a wonderful, wonderful day, William. I also do Seeking Alpha, and I think I got most of the info from that. But yeah. I'm looking to branch out out of, I've done really well with Altria, but yeah, no, it's good. It's definitely good because you're, you're, you're investing in different things that offer uh, different correlations to different assets. That's what diversification is. So I think that's a good lesson for everybody uh, that you should be branching out. You should be diversifying your portfolio because that is how you get better risk adjusted returns. Let's talk about a little bit about shippers. And that's because U.S. shippers are bracing for another possible strike on the East and Gulf Coast ports as labor tensions be between dock workers and port employers are persisting. This comes after a brief but impactful three-day strike in October, which ended with a tentative agreement focused on wages, but left out one key issue, and that is automation. And so the International Longshoremen Association, or the ILA, represents about 45,000 dock workers, and it's preparing to return to the bargaining table next month. With the January 15th deadline looming, many shippers are taking precautionary measures because who knows how labor negotiations are going to go. So what they're doing is they're rerouting a lot of things to the West Coast because you know what? There is a particular holiday season around the horizon, uh, and you have to be prepared for that if you are selling things. Now, the October strike caused, I would say, pretty significant disruptions, and it was only three days. And it caused disruptions at 36 ports, including Houston, New York, Savannah, Georgia, which handles about half of the U.S.'s ocean trade cargo. Now, in the early stages of the negotiations, workers secured a 62% wage increase over six years, but automation is still a primary sticking point. The ILA's leader, Harold Daggett, strongly opposes automation projects, uh, arguing that they are threatening jobs, which they, they are, by definition. Employers, however 
understandably view automation as essential, right? For staying competitive with global ports that have embraced the advanced technologies, because generally speaking, well, automated ports means paying fewer people means costs are lower. And so some industry insiders are kind of skeptical that the two sides will reach an agreement without further work stoppages because both sides are so ingrained about why having automation or not having automation is beneficial for them. Now, port congestion continues to be a challenge even weeks after the strike ended. And again, it was only a three day strike. Ports like Savannah and Houston are still struggling to clear the backlog with 25 container ships currently waiting to come into port. On the retail front, companies like Costco and Levi Strauss shifted goods to the West Coast to avoid the dis- these disruptions. The surge in cargo to the West Coast ports has led to record high volumes in Los Angeles and Long Beach. With Walmart and Target among the largest container ship, ship users, there's a strong industry pressure to avoid further strikes in the new year. But even in spite of that, the path remains pretty uncertain, right? Negotiations next month will be critical in determining whether shippers can resume normal operations or whether we can expect to face another round of disruptions early into 2025 and perhaps through 2025. And we got plenty of time, so let me drop another question from our Invest Talk YouTube channel comment section. This one about NXST. And the question is, greetings from Switzerland. Oh, hello, greetings, greetings from America. I, brought, I bought Nexstar Media Group around a year ago, expecting it to perform well leading up into the elections. Now I need guidance on what to do with my position. Should I sell the stock and invest elsewhere? Or hold it, even though elections are practically over. And so Nexstar Media Group Inc. luckily is a name that pops up nice and easy for me, so we can talk about this one. NXST is a media group. It produces, distributes local, national news, uh, sports media content uh, on both television and digital platforms. They work with uh, the cable networks, right? With your NBCs, your ABCs, your CBSs. I think they actually might be the largest owner uh, of of affiliated stations. Wow. So they reach about 70% of US TV households, right? So if you are looking to get (laughs) exposed to uh, the media business, this is certainly... What you would do it, the way you would do it. Now, over the past 52 weeks, it's up about 29%, uh, 29.34% year to date. It's up 13.82%. And so the core of the question was, well, you started buying this before the election. And why would one do that? Well, there's some seasonality in terms of how uh, companies like this do, especially during election years, right? How do media conglomerates make money? Well, one way is selling advertising. Who advertises a lot? Well, judging on how much money has been raised by presidential candidates, they certainly do. Uh, And, you know, there's actually, here's a fun fact for everybody. There is a set price range at which you can charge presidential candidates, but there is no limit in terms of how you can charge political action committees. And so as more money is flowing to outside of candidates and to these committees, Companies like Nexstar are making more and more money. Now, it is a $5.6 billion market cap company. They have quite a bit of debt, about $7 billion in debt. Their interest coverage ratio is about two times over. So uh, nothing too crazy there in terms of leverage, though they're getting to the scarier end of that leverage. There's a lot of short interest out there, about 7.3% short interest, though nothing too too absurd. And most people hold this name because it pays a solid dividend. About 3.8% is its dividend yield right now. Dividend per share has grown from 1.5 per share to 6.71 per share. And you may be saying to yourself, that is crazy. Well, sometimes dividends per share goes up, not because dividend is going up, but also because shares are going down. And so they bought back shares pretty consistently over the last five years. We actually hold this name. Uh, for clients. And one of the reasons why we hold it for clients in our strategy that focuses on dividends is, well, they pay a pretty solid, consistent dividend. We saw uh, that we would expect it to do well going into the election season. And as we come out of the uh, buyback restriction window, right, companies aren't allowed to buy back shares around earnings. Their earnings go on November 7th. Um, what you could expect to see is the continuation of this program, which they've had over the past five years, which would continue to buy back shares and hold prices 
uh, you know, artificially keep prices higher, right? Because if the company's buying back shares on market, they are a net buyer, uh, more shares are being bought. That's more demand on the buy side. So for us, we see this as a pretty solid company that is fundamentally sound. And not only that, it's trading at a pretty low relative valuation, only two and a half times its book value, about seven times its cash flow. That's about where it's been over the past five years. So Nexstar is a name that we are continuing to hold. So I would give a thumbs up to Nexstar. Thanks for watching. Let's go to Sid from North Carolina, who has a question on NVR. Do you own it or are you looking to buy it? Hey, Luke, thank you for time. No, I do have this in my radar. I am thinking of adding. Looks like a good company, but I want to hear your feedback and what could be the uh, good entry point uh, if you think this is a good company. Thank you so much for your time. Yeah, thanks for calling. So NVR Inc. is a home building and mortgage banking company. It sells and builds homes. And then in an efficient way, likes to offer mortgage financing and provide title services on those homes. In terms of its revenue, it's mostly a home builder. About 98% of its revenue comes from home building. Now, there's a lot to look at for this company, as there's always a lot to look at for all of these companies. So we will tackle this when we get back from the break. Get ahead in your financial journey. Sign up for the KPP Premium Newsletter and receive tailored insights every week. Now, before the break, our friend Sid from North Carolina called in asking about NVR. And as I mentioned, NVR Inc. derives its revenue from two businesses, their home building and then their mortgage banking. The mortgage banking only counts for about 2% of the company's overall revenue. Now, in terms of growth over the past five years, up about 5.7%, though most of that appears to have been really coming out of the pandemic as to be expected. December 2022, revenue about $10.3 billion, projected to be about ten point four this year. A little dip into 2023, but since recovering, net income also getting a peak in 2022 and dipping the next year, but hitting hitting pretty solid $1.6 billion this year. Now, in terms of margins, expanded pretty pretty steadily from 2018, up from 11% net margin in 2018, projected to be about 15% this year, though down from last year's 17%. Now, year to date, they're up about 29% on the 52-week, about 68%. And overall, it's been pretty strong performance, right? But when we're looking at companies, even when we're seeing the revenue growth that we've seen, Even when we're seeing the strong new orders that they're reporting that they have, the question remains, and all we should be asked, yes, looks good, but is it at a good price? And it's trading pretty high above its five-year ranges, priced to book about 6.6, five-year average 5.4, and that includes uh, those pandemic years, and that includes the all-time high revenue year, Uh, price to earnings, forward-looking price earnings about 17 times. You know, overall, uh, I think it is a solid company that has had pretty successful three-year track record coming out of the pandemic. But even from their from their reports, even with their strong balance sheet, and maybe because their margins are starting to contract a little bit, even though they have very little debt, about a one billion dollars of debt on a twenty eight billion dollar market cap company, cash flow is improving, profitability looks solid. They're buying back shares. Still. I think it's a little too expensive. So for now, I would keep it on my watch list. And should it continue to be as fundamentally sound as it has over the past couple years, uh, and certainly earnings were were not terrible, um, I would keep it on my watch list when it comes down to a more reasonable valuation. uh, That is when I would would buy. Thanks for the call. Now, the Federal Reserve is under scrutiny, and they're always under scrutiny, but there are concerns that are growing that it may be moving beyond its traditional role as a lender of last resort. With U.S. fiscal deficits expanding and banks reducing their market activity, the Fed has found itself in an interesting position where it increasingly props up markets, even during periods without major financial stress. What do I mean by this? Well, at the end of September, the Fed's standing repo facility designed to offer temporary cash loans to prevent spikes in short-term interest rates was tapped for about $2.6 billion. But some experts and banking sources suggest there wasn't really a true liquidity problem that day. Instead, they point to a deeper issue. The U.S. Treasury market, now at $28 trillion, may have simply outgrown the ability of banks to manage liquidity efficiently. 
structural challenge is further complicated by rising deficits. And both leading presidential candidates have outlined economic plans that could add trillions of dollars to the national debt. And so analysts are warning that these mounting fiscal pressures will only increase reliance on the Fed's market interventions. Historically, the Fed steps in during financial stress, financial crises like in 2008 or in 2019, where there was some short-lived repo market disruptions, and they do that in order to maintain market stability. But frequent intervention always carries this risk called moral hazard, where market participants assume the Fed will step in, so they take on more and more risky behaviors. Banks are also pulling back from market activities due to stricter post-2008 regulations, which makes these which makes facilitating trades less profitable. Foreign banks often reduce their exposure at the end of each quarter, known as window dressing. That adds to the strain on liquidity. When liquidity dried up at the end of September, a key repo rate briefly spiked to 522. Even though the Fed's intervention helped stabilize it soon after, it's still something of note. So looking ahead, it's possible that year-end pressures could strain liquidity even further. While the Fed support has been critical in maintaining market stability, it may also crowd out other investors, potentially inflating asset bubbles. That's what we saw coming out of the 2019 pandemic. And so it's a balancing act, and it's going to be interesting to see, given the likelihood of where the debt is going, how the Fed will react. I'm Luke Guerrero, and this completes another Invest Talk program. We thank you for listening. We encourage you to tell your friends and family members about our free podcast downloads. Get yours at iTunes, Google Play, and Spotify. Remember, We can help you better understand your portfolio dynamics and calculate your investor risk number. Let's head over to investtalk.com and sign up for the no obligation, free and confidential portfolio review by clicking the portfolio review button. Independent thinking, shared success. This is Invest Talk. Good night.